Welcome back. You're watching our special discussion as we assess the 100-day performance of the Modi administration. Let me bring in Satya Podar and Siddharth Vardarajan into this conversation. Satya Podar, let me start by asking you, I think perhaps the one big disappointment of the Modi administration so far has been on the tax reform front because there was a lot of expectation, you know, on every occasion possible. The finance minister, now the finance minister, then uh, leader of the opposition spoke about ending tax terrorism. The prime minister spoke about exactly the same thing. And yet, when we saw the budget, there was no changes as far as the retro tax is concerned. Fortunately, they have now decided to set up a panel, and the CBDT panel has only just been set up to address issues of retrospective taxation. There is no timeline as far as the GST is concerned. There is no clarity on what they want to do with the DTC. And even on GAR, a clarification coming from the government has been wishy-washy about what they really intend to do as far as GAR is concerned. Are you disappointed? Not at all, actually. Uh... On further reflection, many people will call the government's uh, agenda on tax reform to be dull and boring. Uh, in my view, it's extremely tactful. Uh, and the reforms or the measures they've announced, even though they sound like Mickey Mouse, but they are not Mickey Mouse at all. If you, if you announce any policy changes in the Indian environment in a big and bold manner, they become controversial. Mm -hmm. And the controversy basically is counterproductive. Right. They delay and derail the process of tax reform. So what the government has done, uh, and this is a view that has, has now emerged, is that government makes very low-key announcements on all these policies of the guard, retrospective amendment, uh, disputes, tax terrorism, mm. even the GST. Mm. But... But that uh, sort of low-key denouncement does not mean that the government has not initiated action on the big bang reforms. These are indeed big bang reforms, and the only way to implement them is to have a measured, low-key discussion, conciliatory in nature, mm. and allow the parties or different stakeholders... This wasn't your view right no, after wasn't. the budget. No, it wasn't. I had a conversation with you right after the budget, and you were disappointed with what this government had done or not done on the tax front. I, I, was, I was indeed disappointed, but now I have come to realize that uh, the government is delivering slowly on those reforms, but it's delivering in a very low-key manner. So it's manner. a deliberate attempt at being subtle. The point that Ashok Wada was yes. making, wherever there's controversy, especially on things like oil and gas and so on and so forth, or tax reforms, be subtle, amplify Dhanjan Yojana, talk about it for four hours on television. But as far as controversial issues are concerned, stay under the radar. The best way to handle the controversy is not by making it a big bang. And a good example is GST. The government could not have done anything in a big bang manner because they, they knew the opposition of the state governments to a number of policies, and if they come with a definitive commitment that I'll do this and this mm. and make proposal, counter-proposal, we would be on a treadmill the way we have been in the past five years. So it's yet to be seen whether this new approach gives success, yeah. but definitely... Uh, well, the new approach is clearly being missed because as far as tax reforms are concerned, our poll suggests that India Inc. is disappointed. I think he's got a 4.5 on 10 rating. So, so clearly the subtle approach uh, hasn't yet been fully understood by corporate <laughs> India. Well, so am I <laughs> in terms of the outcome to date. But I give the government a lot of credit for maintaining the momentum. Maintain, continuing the dialogue. Okay. And even now, the policies coming out of the government uh, in terms of the circulars are not necessarily the most uh, desirable uh, circulars I'd like to see. Okay. But every time now, we, when we go back to the government, they frankly admit that, yes, yes, we'll reconsider. So this is an amazing turn of events. Amazing change in attitudes. Just about a week ago... Well, you just swung that poll, sir. Look at that poll. It says four and a half on ten. You've, you've just swung that poll. Satya Podar sitting right here in the studio on tax reforms. And Siddharth Vardarajan, let me come to you. Because on foreign policy, uh, there has been consensus uh, within the respondents that this government has done a great job, whether it's positioning itself as a leader in this region, reaching out to other South nations, whether it is reaching out to Japan, and now, of course, the, the big Obama meeting, uh, consensus that on international relations and foreign policy, this government has delivered in the first hundred days. There's a high level of continuity between what uh, Mr. Modi is doing on the foreign policy front and what uh, Manmohan Singh did, with one exception, which is 
that uh, right from day one, Modi has uh, decided to pay close attention to the neighborhood. And he's, he's made gestures that Manmohan was unable to make in 10 years. Uh, the only uh, point on which one could fault Mr. Modi is that having started in a bold manner with Pakistan, to then allow uh, a relatively trivial incident, uh, like the meeting of the High Commissioner with the Hurriyat, uh, which has gone on, you know, for, it's, it's been a ritual meeting for the last 15 years, and the government had four or five days notice before the meeting was to take place. So to allow, to allow yourself to be caught unawares and then to overreact, uh, to my mind, has contributed something of a setback on the Pakistan front. But as far as Bangladesh, Nepal, Bhutan, I think he's made an excellent opening. The BRICS outing, uh, his forthcoming visit to Japan, uh, where he builds upon uh, the uh, work done over the last 10 years, I think will, uh, you know, will uh, again yield further success. So I think, you know, foreign policy is the easy thing, but I think the difficulty is, is in converting uh, your successes on the foreign policy front into something tangible domestically. And that's where, you know, uh, just if I were to relate our discussion now to what we've been talking about for the last 20 minutes, you know, in the, in the, in the, in the last 100 days, We've seen a surfeit of announcements of one kind or the other, declarations, grand declarations of intent, uh, promises of one kind or the other. But many of those promises uh, have not been backed up with the kind of uh, fiscal heft uh, that they need. You know, for example, in the budget itself, or prior to the budget, talking of uh, housing for poor people, sanitation. Uh, you look at the actual budgetary provisions, uh, they're hardly much of an improvement over what was there in the earlier uh, in, in the preceding budget. So I think that, uh, the, you know, these are early days, and I think the Modi government needs to get its priorities straight. One good thing that it has to, uh, that it has done, and here, uh, you know, Dr. Rajiv Kumar will forgive me, uh, is that uh, it has not listened uh, so attentively to the uh, insistent and, uh, you know, sort of persistent demands for so-called bold reforms by uh, market-oriented uh, economists and by big business. I think it's proceed, it's, he's done well to proceed cautiously. Uh, you can't rush into things uh, in this manner. Uh, some things that have happened have happened under the radar and are actually negative. For example, on the environment front, and you can see that uh, the Supreme Court has already pulled up the government for uh, the manner in which the Wildlife Board has c cleared projects, industrial projects, uh, in, a, in a hurried manner. So I think that, you know, the Modi government would, be, would do well to not make haste uh, but to actually uh, ponder over what it needs to do, uh, design its approaches, find the money and then proceed in a steady manner rather than being preoccupied with uh, doing things in a hurry or being preoccupied with trying to show as if you're doing something different from the previous government. You know, I want to take that point forward, uh, Rajiv Kumar, the point that Siddharth Vardarajan was making uh, about this, you know, uh, this big, bold measures that Corporate India was expecting on food subsidy, for instance, on oil subsidy, uh, on land. Uh, and, and we heard from, from uh, Mr. Modi, we heard from other members of the cabinet, Nitin Gadkari, saying that within the budget session itself, we will move amendments to the Land Acquisition Act and so on and so forth. But as Mr. Chidambaram once pointed out to me, he said, political reality will teach them a lesson and perhaps that is what we are now beginning to see happen, that a much more measured, cautious approach on all of these things, which, uh, you know, you accuse the UPA government of dole-based economics and so on and so forth, but they haven't moved or graduated away from any of that. It's the political reality. Yeah, Shireen, I must clarify, no, 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 I must clarify because I think Siddharth has accused me of something quite wrong. Because I said very clearly that I did not want the government to make or rush into bold or big bang reform, but I wanted the government to lay down a vision of where they wanted to go to actually boost up, boost investor sentiment. And that is very different from saying that I will, I'm ideologically uh, led to have a sort of, you know, market-based or market-oriented reform. So, no, I'm not at all. I'm not saying that. I'm actually quite impressed with the government, uh, with the government for having, for doing its homework, for getting its act together. It's like an iceberg. I can see that they're doing a lot of work beneath the water. Seventh-eighth of it is done beneath the water. And then you roll out the, you know, the, the reforms. So that's, that's my stand. My stand is not to rush into anything. Absolutely recognize the reality, follow the Chinese proverb of crossing the river while feeling the pebbles you know, under your feet, but tell the people that you want to cross the river, that you don't want to be standing on this side of the river for times to come. Now, this is, this is where I think we need a bolder statement of a framework, of a vision, of, of, of sector after sector. Now, look at, look at education. 
I don't think it can be anybody's case that the current system of education, primarily to higher education, university education, is, is just full of roses. It's, it's the best thing that you've got. And if you allocate more money on a broken system, you just put both, you know, bad, good money behind the bad ones. So what I would have wanted for the government to say, look, I want my education system looking like this, but I would take my time to do so, so that I can take care of the ground realities and not create you know, and not upset things or not create confusion, but there is none. So inc incremental reforms is all very well, Shireen, but the point is that incremental reforms, which is so subtle that is not noticed by anybody, does not help the investor sentiment. That's the point. I, I take your you point. Have I, 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 want to, I want to get Siddharth to comment on that because you've raised a very important point on education. And I think a lot of the discussion that we're having, uh, the point that Siddharth also made, that you're making these grand declarations and perhaps not backed enough by fiscal heft or even intent. Education is a classic example where the Prime Minister said he wants to skill India and education must be uh, emphasized and so on and so forth. And that's been the one ministry where we've seen disappointment after disappointment. Siddharth Vadarajan, would you agree? I, I would agree, Fred. First of all, just a quick apology to Rajiv Kumar. I actually, my criticism was, was more aimed at uh, people like Arvind Panagriya uh, and at, at the business community. I think uh, Dr. Rajiv Kumar's approach is quite correct. On the question of education, you know, it's again the same preoccupation with, with grandiose declarations. Like, how often have we heard Mr. Modi and Smriti Rani, the education minister, say that I want to, we want to create uh, 10 new IITs and 20 new IIMs? You know, they don't even realize that you are having a tough time filling the faculty, you know, filling faculty positions in existing IITs. So as Rajiv says, you know, your, your current system is, I wouldn't say completely dysfunctional, but it has uh, many dysfunctional elements in it. And unless you rectify that in a, in a consultative manner, again, you know, there's a slight tendency for the HRD ministry and UGC to act on the basis of diktats. I think the, the manner in which the four-year program of Delhi University was handled, uh, you know, one can argue about the merits of this. I'm not getting into that. But, you know, the, I think the process, you, know, you need a process of consultation. You know, she's already uh, begun to fight with the heads of IITs over, you know, over who has the right to uh, decide policies. You know, I think that education is such a crucial uh, department, such a crucial field, and it's so central to what the Modi government uh, says it wants to do with this country that, uh, you know, frankly, I wish that uh, uh, more attention were paid and there was a more systematic scientific approach to, uh, to this and what we've seen so far. Yeah, I, I don't think anybody will quibble with that, but Ashok Vadva, uh, let me come to you now, because I remember reading an AMBIT report where, uh, you know, you talked about how there needs to now begin, uh, there needs to now be a catch-up between what the perception is or what the expectation is and what is actually changing on the ground in terms of reality, in terms of policy action. If I would ask you now to lay out a roadmap of the next 100 days, because that's what everybody is focusing on, Rajiv Kumar, they're saying that the government must now spell out very clearly its intent. If I would ask you to articulate, what would you like to see over the next 100 days which would infuse investors, domestic and foreign, which would ensure that the kind of money that is expected and the kind of money that's coming in will continue, what is it that you would like to see? I would, I would identify three specific areas, Shirin. Um, and they, you know, these things have a, a intermingled effect on the subject that we are discussing, which is you know, living up to the expectations and improving the sentiment for capital expenditure and greater investment, both FDI and local investment. I would say the first thing I'd like to see is a defined and definitive program of how government intends to tackle food inflation. Uh, let's not forget that one of the most important elements to create a more friendly and encouraging environment for investment, particularly by our domestic entrepreneurs, is to make capital more accessible and relatively cheaper. Uh, and, and we know Reserve Bank's uh, policy, right policy, correct policy, that unless we see, uh, unless we see quarter after quarter of, uh, of, uh, of attention and, and, and containment of food inflation, uh, you know, we're not in a position to be able to, you know, demonstrate a, a roadmap towards when and how uh, interest rates will come down. So I would like to see government take some definitive action and, and have a program I recognize that the program cannot be both defined and implemented within 100 days, but even the recognition and the definition of a roadmap towards that would be a very important step. As I said, it will enable RBI to take some bolder steps, which in turn will support domestic investment. 
The second thing I would like to see, and, and here I, I disagree with uh, one of my other panel members, I, I have to say that I was disappointed with the budget. As a matter of fact, uh, just after the budget, I, I felt that the government had done enough um, and, and more given the short term that uh, the finance minister had between the government coming to power and the announcement of the budget. But honestly, as one has had a chance to reflect upon uh, the pre-election statements, uh, the intent as, as we heard the finance minister and then the legislation as we have read, there is a wee bit of disappointment that retroactive tax amendment continues to be a bogey. It does not need to exist. Believe me, the government is not going to collect significant taxes through that mechanism. Uh, you might as well understand the positive impact it will have on foreign direct investment. So, so let's be bold and very clearly state a policy, not be, not, not, let not that policy be arbitrary in any form and shape. Equally on GAR, equally on, on, on some definitive roadmap for, for GST. So I would think there needs to be clarity on issues which were easy to tackle where, where there was expectation. And I'm sure the government has its own challenges in terms of how it deals with ongoing situations. But, but you know, clarity is going to be critical in that, in that subject. Uh, I would say those would... Those, those would be the, the key priorities that you're laying out. I am going to have to take another quick commercial break, but when we return, we will take that uh, uh, discussion forward, and we'll also talk about perhaps the biggest achievement of the Modi government, and that is the way that it's tried to improve governance or better our current governance structures. That and more when we return on this special discussion.